one is by Daniel Dadouche from the CWI in Amsterdam. Daniel. All right, thank you very much. So I'll talk today about uh, approximating covering radius, finding dense lattice subspaces, uh, and how it all relates to integer programming. Uh, so the outline of the talk is I'm going to talk first about integer programming. Open question there, how algorithms for IP, uh, worst case algorithms work, and its relationship to a conjecture that's called the kanan lovas conjecture. Uh, that will be probably the semi-understandable part of the talk. And then we will move on to the mostly <laughs> incomprehensible part of the talk, uh, which will be about uh, uh, adventures in trying to prove it, okay? Um, so integer programming, classic problem. Uh, we want to uh, minimize over the integer points inside uh, a polytope. And the big open question, uh, at least uh, from the perspective of this talk, is can we solve this in singly exponential time? Uh, and um, as I actually already mentioned last week, there is uh, an n to the order n uh, time algorithm for this, uh, and it's due to Kanan. So uh, let me tell you roughly how these algorithms work with a, a kind of updated perspective that uh, in fact comes from my thesis, uh, which will point you to at least uh, a bottleneck that, that one can hope to improve. So there are two cases. This is sort of a dichotomous situation in, when you're trying to solve IP. So here I'm just gonna try and find a feasible integer point, not maximize, but it's not much different. Um, so the first case is like if you have your body K and it's like super big, okay? And they're like sort of clearly tons of lattice points inside this. And the way in which we quantify that is in terms of the covering radius of the body. Uh, so the covering radius of the body is the minimum scaling such that no matter where I shift it, I still intersect uh, the integers, okay? So now, I mean, you can, you can check that, in fact, this is sort of the worst case. I should scale it down by two-thirds, and if I scale it down any further, I'm not going to contain lattice points in every possible shift. Okay. So in this case, this is somehow the easy case, when the body is like really big and fat, it turns out we can find the integer points inside here in singly exponential time. So this is not the hard part. The hard part is when this is not the situation. Um, and so when it's not the situation, the covering radius is somehow big. And uh, this is when we say that sort of K is flat in some way, shape, or form. And sort of the most general way of quantifying when, how, that could, how that could be good, and this may be something that uh, many of you have not seen formalized this way, is that if it's flat, uh, it turns out that there should be an integral projection of some dimension, which I'm not gonna specify, uh, such that the volume of the projection is small. So let's do this for a one-dimensional projection. Here is uh, the projection onto uh, the y-axis, and you can see that here the volume uh, is two, okay? And this volume is two, in fact, will roughly correspond to sort of the number of fibers of this projection that could possibly correspond to feasible points upstairs. And usually the goal is to uh, sort of recurse on all of these subproblems. And uh, in my thesis, sort of what I showed is that um, you can basically recurse on all of these subproblems in time that's sort of proportional to this volume, okay? And the reason we normalize the volume by the power of one over K is because here I'm sort of killing K dimensions of the problem uh, uh, at this cost, uh, which is sort of the effective branch, this is like the effective branching factor, okay? Um, so those are the two dichotomous situations. Now the question is, you know, what, what is going on with this quantity? Um, so it turns out that this quantity is, in fact, so this is sort of the best possible projection. There is a direct duality relationship between it and the covering radius, okay? So this left-hand side, it turns out, is easy. I will prove a special case of it later. And uh, this is the hard side, okay? So this is... Uh, what controls the branching factor of your integer program. Um, and one interesting thing is to think about this, and I mean, that'll come up later, uh, that these guys, so this projection matrix is to some extent an efficiently checkable certificate that the covering radius itself is large, okay, just using the easy side. Um, good. So uh, we have flatness theorems that quantify how flat uh, uh, the, uh, the body uh, can be in this case. 
Uh, and the first case that was studied was in the case where the, the rank of the projection is one. So it's really just an integer vector, okay? Uh, and here, after a lot, a lot of work, um, which will come up here, uh, we've been able to show, or people, you know, many researchers have been able to show that you can bound it by a polynomial in dimension. So this is basically the branching factor. Um, and, uh, uh, and you get this sort of n to the four thirds times some polylogarithms, okay? Um, and there is a conjecture that in fact, the correct right hand side should not be poly, you know, n to the four thirds, it should just be n. And if that's the case, then it's tight. You can just take like a simplex, scale it up by n and convince yourself that that's a tight example. Okay, great. So we have uh, uh, tons of dimensions that we could play with. Why play with just one? Okay, so what happens if you uh, play with more dimensions? So if you don't restrict yourself to finding a uh, rank one integer projection. Uh, then it turns out that uh, there is a, actually a remarkably easy proof. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's, it's not that easy, but it's, it's much easier than the previous proof that the sort of effective branching factor you get this way is bounded by n. Okay, so n is better than n to the four thirds. The branching factor is still polynomial. We're still gonna get things like n to the order n time. Why do we care? Um, so the conjecture is that, in fact, the truth should be much, much better. Uh, and uh, possibly the right-hand side, so the effective branching factor, should be even logarithmic in dimension, or polylogarithmic. Okay. How computable are these quantities? Uh, so they can be computed. I have an algorithm to compute these things in like horrendous complexity, which is more horrible than, uh, than the complexity of IP. Uh, but you will see later that, that uh, yeah, you'll see later. I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it. Um, but they, they are, to some extent, computable. Um, okay, so the right, right hand side uh, uh, also cannot be smaller than log n, and there is a very nice counterexample. All these, I mean, ex uh, tight example, and all these examples are very simple. They're all like scalings of the simplex. Somehow, uh, these conjectures are sort of difficult for uh, like stupid looking examples. Um, good. Uh, so what is the uh, uh, conclusion uh, is that in fact, if the conjecture were true and you could somehow magically compute this thing in uh, uh, let's say singly exponential time, then okay, instead of n to the n, you would get log n to the n and we would all be very happy and call it a day. Um, so, so uh, you know, of course, you know, if pigs could fly, we could do anything. So, is this true in any you know situation? Okay. So, uh, the main question that uh, we tried to solve uh, was: uh, Is this conjecture at least true in the case where your body is an ellipsoid? And this is uh, like not a simple case. I mean, as you'll as you'll see. Uh, and the answer uh, to this question, as was answered by Regev and Stevens Davidowitz, is yes. Okay, so it turns out that, uh, in fact, uh, if you restrict your bodies to being ellipsoids, the conjecture is true. Um, um, uh, and can we compute the projection? So in fact, the previous result that I just mentioned was an existential result, and it turns out in this talk, uh, uh, I can show that yes, you can indeed compute the uh, projection in single exponential time. So let's uh, go to the second part of the talk, where uh, I will probably start losing many of you, so just ask me questions. Uh, and probably if I get through all my slides, something went horribly wrong, so, so stop me. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk about algorithms and refinements of the conjecture in the case of ellipsoids, which we call the L2 case, okay? So it turns out that it's uh, you know, much better for your health to not think about ellipsoids. For the, for, for the ellipsoid, you have a single exponential. Yes, okay, good point. Yes, so for ellipsoids, we know how to do everything in a different way, but this is hopefully going to generalize, right? So the, the, the point is the techniques that we come up uh, with here are very different uh, and you know, seem like they get us non-trivially close to the general case, okay? All right, so that's, that's a good point. We do know how to do everything in single exponential time for ellipsoids. All right, so it turns out that it's much easier for your health to uh, sort of fold the geometry into the lattice. So transform your ellipsoid into a ball, and now instead of the integer lattice, you have a linear transformation of the integer lattice, okay? So then instead of uh, all the geometry is sort of folded into the lattice, um, 
so what are lattices? Okay, so this is the integer lattice. That's what we were looking at before. Uh, more generally, you can take uh, integer linear combinations of any basis, okay, of Rn. Uh, and here you can see that there are many different ways of specifying uh, the same lattice. Um, and the quantity of crucial importance for us today is the determinant, which if you take any uh, basis, it's uh, the volume of the fundamental parallel pipette. Uh, but even more importantly, it's also equal to the volume of any region that tiles space with respect to the lattice, okay? Um, so any region that tiles space uh, with respect to the lattice has exactly the same volume, and so it's, it's, a, it's a invariant, a useful invariant. Um, so now let's kind of uh, do some translation and try and restate everything in the context of sort of L2 and lattices. And here I'll be able to, to show some of the simple proofs that I, I skipped before. So the covering radius is just now going to be the kind of farthest distance away from the lattice I can be, right? That's, that's uh, the covering radius. And if you look at this beautiful object known as the Voronoi cell, so this is all the points that are closer to the origin than anyone else, uh, you can see that the covering radius is exactly the smallest ball that I need to uh, contain the Voronoi cell, okay? Um, so now let's try and reprove these kind of volumetric lower bounds that I claimed were the easy side that we didn't see last time. Um, and so they really all stem from the kind of trivial fact that this ball has to have at least the same volume as the Voronoi cell, right? And importantly, the Voronoi cell, because it's a tiling region, has volume equal to the determinant. Um, and so if you move everything around, uh, and you remember that volume is sort of n homogeneous uh, in, in, in Rn, you will get this lower bound on uh, the covering radius, okay? Um, but now uh, uh, there were all these projections and things going on in the, in, in the, in the previous part of the talk, so where are they here? Um, so it comes from, uh, okay, so this, by the way, notation is just like I'm ignoring constant factors, okay? Uh, so this is roughly what the bound is. Um, okay, so I'm uh, bringing back in projections. So now let me use this uh, nice notation to say that I can project the lattice uh, onto a subspace W. And uh, I mean, orthogonal projections shrink Euclidean distances. So if you think about it, uh, the covering radius after I shrink uh, should get smaller, right? So if the covering radius after I shrink should get smaller, uh, then I can sort of apply the lower bound here and get a new lower bound here, okay? So uh, that gives me this, all right? And now uh, I can sort of maximize over all of these lower bounds, and um, this is essentially the, the kind of dual quantity of what I showed you before, but it's basically, you know, the best possible volumetric lower bound you can get for the covering radius. Um, Good, so what is the L2 version of the sort of kanan lovas conjecture? Is, uh, so somehow this we know is a lower bound, uh, but is it also an upper bound, right? So that's really the question. Um, and this number is, is you know, by, by how much are we off, okay? Um, so also it's easy to see in this particular case that, uh, okay, square root of log n, so anything when you do things in L2 you get square roots. Uh, so square root of log n is, uh, in fact, uh, the best possible. And again, it's a very simple example. Uh, it's just like a scaling of the integer lattice. Um, so what is it that is, that is known, okay? So in, in 88, Kanan and Lovas, when uh, uh, they worked on this, they showed that this constant for L2 is bounded by square root of n, which is better than n, uh, which they had for the general case. And basically, that was it. Uh, until last year, uh, and last year, uh, uh, Oded Regev and I showed that if you assume a conjecture that maybe I will have time to talk about at the end, uh, then in fact this number is bounded by a polylog. Okay. Uh, and then this year uh, at Stock, uh, uh, Regev and, and uh, Noah Stevens Davidowitz uh, proved this Ramirez Muskowski conjecture and slightly improved our reduction and showed that, in fact, for L2, this is bounded by log to the 3 halves n. All right? Uh, so now, I mean, the rest of the talk is going to be talking about refinements of what was going on there. Uh, so, so any questions so far? Uh, is, is it given 
idea of what the reverse Minkowski conjecture is? Uh, it's so I will I will say it at the, at the end hopefully, but basically the point is rever uh, Minkowski's theorem tells you that uh, a lower bound on the number of lattice points in terms of sublattice determinants. Okay, or in terms of lattice determinants. So if your determinant is small, you should have a lot of lattice points. Uh, and reverse Minkowski is the opposite. So if all your determinants are big, uh, can you upper bound the number of lattice points? Uh, so good. All good so far? Okay. Um, so uh, what do we show? So first, as I mentioned, there is kind of an algorithmic aspect that was missing in the previous uh, result. Um, so we show that uh, you can actually find this subspace with, uh, it's a bit worse, it's not like log n to the 3 halves, uh, but it's log n to the 2.5, but I guess still good enough for government work, uh, and in singly exponential time. Now what's the, the second thing that we show, uh, or that I show? Uh, ah, okay. And how does this compare to, to prior work? So, I mean, in, in the paper of Kanan and Lovas, they use, if people know, an HKZ basis, and now we know how to compute HKZ basis in two to the n time, so, so somehow that was already algorithmic. Uh, I showed with Daniela Michancio that if you want to compute the best possible subspace, I mean, I don't care what this bound is, but I just the best possible subspace, then I can do it in uh, a, a ludicrous amount of time. And that also extends to general convex bodies, the thing, that, that was the question that you asked. Uh, but this we can do better. Um, good. And the second thing, and this is, was at least to me very surprising, um, is that you, you can do better than just use uh, uh, projections, uh, projection determinants to get a lower bound on the, uh, on the covering radius of the lattice. Uh, so if you only use uh, uh, projection uh, determinants, uh, you are stuck with square root log n as a lower bound. Uh, but it turns out if you're a little bit more careful, uh, you can get it within a constant factor. So you can get a lower bound that is tight within a constant factor, assuming the slicing conjecture for Voronoi cells. Uh, so what on earth is the slicing conjecture? Uh, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to get much into it. But basically it says if you have any Voronoi cell and it has volume one, then it should have a slice of lower bounded constant volume. Okay, so that's the slicing conjecture for Voronoi cells. Um, okay, so now we will get to uh, probably the completely uh, unintelligible part of the talk. Um, so now I'll tell you sort of a lot of the, the kind of new techniques that came in uh, 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 to proving this, but only at a very kind of floozy uh, level. Um, so the first thing, well, actually, okay, yeah. So, so first thing, some notation. Um, if I have a sublattice, then you know, and it's empty, then the convention is the determinant is one. Um, also, because there's a lot of normalized determinants that are going to appear everywhere, let me just use this to shortcut that so that it makes the notation less horrible. Um, and if I write this notation, it is not L quotiented M. Uh, that would be probably the more reasonable thing, uh, but instead it is L projected orthogonal to M, okay, the span of M. So this is, is going to be the projections, uh, and, and it'll be helpful. All right, so, um, so I said new, but in fact this is from 76, it's just that none of us knew about it, uh, well, except for Stuhler. Um, and uh, uh, it's really beautiful. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, what Stuhler and, and company uh, uh, showed, so these are people who are interested in uh, questions that I don't even understand in the reduction theory of quadratic forms. Um, they looked at this amazing object that's called the canonical polytope. And what it is, is you have a lattice, it's in dimensions, you uh, draw the scatter plot with, so you have coordinates uh, that index dimension from zero to n. At zero, you put the point zero, zero. At n, you put the point n, comma, log determinant of L. Uh, and everywhere else, you put points uh, at k, comma, log det m, where m is any sublattice of dimension k, okay? Uh, and now what you look at is the kind of uh, lower convex hull of this, this polytope. So we're interested in, in this line, okay? And this will turn out to be the correct way to break up your lattice into pieces. Um, and uh, what is amazing about this thing, and uh, people who know about 
you know, things like determinant being log submodular, maybe not so impressed by this, but I was, uh, is that if you look at the vertices of this, so you look at the lattices that correspond to the vertices of this, these form a chain, okay? So they're nested one inside each other. Uh, and um, yeah, well, I'll get to the remaining properties in a second, but they form a chain and they're unique. Um, good. Um, and the, the important thing, nice thing, is that the sort of slopes that you see here correspond to normalized determinants. So they're little normalized determinants of blocks. Um, so slope equals determinant or normalized determinant. Uh, so an n-dimensional lattice is stable uh, if uh, its uh, canonical filtration, which was this thing that corresponded to the chain, is trivial, which means that this uh, 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 lower convex hull is just a straight line. Okay, and what this means is that there's sort of no dense sublattices lying in your lattice. Um, one example, you take the integer lattice, the minimum determinants that you get for every dimension just correspond to coordinate projections, so they all have determinant one, meaning the log is zero. So this is the line that you get for uh, the integer lattice. Okay, so it, 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 it is stable, it, it has trivial canonical filtration. Um, why are these useful? Um, uh, good, oh yeah, some properties uh, that I forgot to mention. So I said uh, these guys form a chain uh, it turns out that the blocks themselves are stable, which you can kind of see from the picture that like this is a straight line, uh, which is what I was saying about stability. And the slopes are increasing, meaning these kind of normalized determinants of blocks are, are going up. Um, good, so why are these useful? So first, it turns out that the fundamental block that makes sense to look at this uh, uh, kanan lovas conjecture is, is a stable lattice. Sort of for a stable lattice, it turns out that there are no good projections other than sort of the determinant of the lattice itself, i.e. the full projection. So you're going to have to prove something for, for stable lattices to begin with. And what they showed uh, in a sort of very beautiful argument is that the covering radius is bounded by sort of, this is exactly what you would want for Kanan and Lovas. And this turns out to be uh, uh, the slicing constant uh, for Voronoi cells of stable lattices. Okay, um, and then they show using this reverse Minkowski conjecture, which I didn't uh, show you, that in fact they can unconditionally bound this by log n. So for general convex bodies, the best thing we have is n to the one quarter, uh, which is much much bigger than log n. So uh, uh, you know, Voronoi cells are special somehow. Um, good. So that's what they show. Uh, and then how do they get things for all lattices? So here I'm gonna be super floozy. So basically they're going to take an argument that breaks the lattice up along its canonical filtration. Um, and then in a very simple way, you basically argue that you know, your covering radius, so now it's L2, so everything is squared. Your covering radius is upper bounded by sort of the covering radiuses of the little blocks. Um, and this is sort of generically true. It doesn't matter that this is a canonical filtration or not. Any chain, this would be the situation. Um, and then something uh, sort of magical happens. Uh, so they're able to bring in this uh, slicing constant that is related to the fact that these blocks are stable. Uh, but then they have to relate it to the form that Kanan and Lovas is looking for, which is uh, basically a projection of the entire lattice. So these are little blocks, which is not what we're looking for, but instead we're looking at projections of the entire lattice. And when you do that, you get this extra log n factor that shows up, all right? And this is exactly what, what Kanan and Lovas were looking for. So this, the square root of this is the bound that you get. So that's log n to the two point, uh, uh, 3.5, ah, 1.5. Um, okay, so what do I show? The last five minutes I have. Uh, so this is one uh, first result is um, we can do this argument again, but sort of stop earlier. Um, so you do sort of what you would hope to be able to do, which is sort of directly use the fact that these are stable and use the bound that uh, 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 Regev and Davidovich showed for each uh, stable block. Uh, and then it turns out that you can just stop there. So uh, what does that mean? That means that what I have here is in fact a lower bound on the covering radius. Um, and this is sort of a new form of a certificate for uh, 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 the covering radius. 
Uh, and more generally, the statement is, um, so it doesn't matter if you have sort of this canonical filtration, if you have any uh, chain of sublattices, and you have that the sort of corresponding slopes have this increasing property, uh, then you get the following lower bound. So you can basically uh, chain information that you get from all the blocks as opposed to using one block. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the proof of this, but I will say that you know to, to, to get this lower bound, uh, I use from previous work a semi-definite program uh, relaxation that gives me lower bounds for the covering radius. And I show that any chain of that form can be uh, with increasing slopes can be turned into a feasible solution. So there was supposed to be continuous relaxation, so I said semi-definite program. Good. Uh, um, all right, so what's the absolute last uh, part, uh, if you aren't completely lost already? Uh, so we want to find these good projections efficiently. Okay, efficiently means single exponential time. And it turns out that to do this, you kind of need an approximate notion of this canonical filtration, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, but what I will say a few words about is the sort of key subproblem, which is trying to find dense lattice subspaces. Okay, so basically I want to find a sublattice, non-trivial, uh, that has approximately minimal normalized determinant. So in particular, I have no idea what rank this sublattice is. And if you look at the picture, what I'm trying to do is find sort of a sublattice that has essentially the minimum slope in this, that has approximately the minimum slope. Um, so what is the uh, very, very vague, uh, uh, okay, no, not high level idea yet. Uh, so what's the statement? So the statement is that we can compute this up to a log n factor, okay? So log n approximate minimizers uh, in single exponential time. Uh, and what's the very vague idea, and I'll I guess say a little bit more, uh, is that basically if I start, I'm gonna start with my guess being the full lattice, and if it turns out that it's not an approximate minimizer, then I'm going to learn a you know, co-dimension one sub-lattice that uh, contains uh, the minimizer, and I'm gonna do this by sampling the discrete Gaussian from the dual lattice. So let me tell you what just at least the discrete Gaussian is. Uh, so the discrete Gaussian is this beautiful discrete distribution over a lattice, and it has a parameter and it looks like a Gaussian. Uh, and if you make the parameter smaller, uh, you get smaller vectors. Uh, you get shorter vectors. So somehow getting short vectors is generically useful thing, uh, and it will also be useful here. Uh, and the important thing about the discrete Gaussian is that we can actually sample it in single exponential time uh, for any parameter s. So how do we use this? Um, so I mentioned that I need to use the dual lattice. So what on earth is a dual lattice? It's just everybody that has integer inner products with uh, the original lattice. So if you, uh, uh, dual lattice points just give you kind of hyperplanes that, uh, uh, lattice hyperplanes, which makes sense if I'm trying to reduce dimension by one. Um, and uh, the, you know, so if you start with the integer lattice, the reason you never hear about duals is because the dual of the integer lattice is itself. Two minutes. Um, good. And uh, whatever, whatever. Um, yeah, so what, what is the, the sort of algorithm uh, to find my dense lattice subspace? I sort of guess the minimum determinant. I check to see if my current determinant is too big or uh, sorry, if it's uh, the right size, I return it. If it's too big, I sample from the discrete Gaussian and I repeat on co-dimension one sublattice, okay? And the key point is that your, the vector that you sample is gonna be orthogonal to the space that you're trying to find with high probability. Uh, and to analyze that, we need the reverse Minkowski theorem, which I will tell you about in the last two slides. Um, so what did Minkowski say in 1889? Uh, paraphrasing, he said, if I have a lattice uh, that has a determinant less than one, and uh, I look at you know, a radius of about square root n, he showed a lower bound that you basically have an exponential number of points at, at, that, at that radius. And this is because the ball of volume square root n, uh, of uh, radius square root n, has e uh, exponential volume uh, in dimension. Um, so you can specialize that a little bit. And notice that he also says something if you have sublattices of low uh, uh, determinants. So if you have a sublattice, 
that has a determinant less than one, and its dimension is k, then in fact you can show that you have exponentially k number of points at distance root k. So this is just the trivial thing by applying Minkowski's theorem to the sublattice. So what is the, the conjecture, the sort of reversal of that? So the question is, if all the non-trivial sublattices of L have determinant at least one, uh, is this an upper bound as opposed to a lower bound? And the answer is yes, uh, except that uh, you have this extra logarithmic term, uh, and this is essentially tight for the integer lattice. Uh, okay, uh, I'm done. Okay, thank you. So why people are setting up? Uh, are there questions? What's the simplest example of a lattice that's not stable? Uh, I mean, you 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 take uh, z n and uh, scale one vector down or something by a little bit. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Stable. Yeah. It's it's a. Uh, it's it. It's not a, um, a robust thing in that way. Yeah. Other questions? So the, um, I have a question. I mean, the, um, this uh, kanan lubas conjecture for ellipsoids, I mean, the, the bounds that are proven there, do they also give uh, better, let's say, uh, better than n to the n uh, time algorithms for, let's say, closest vector? Yeah. And yeah. also, of course, in space, right? This would be polynomial space, or? No. Uh... Uh, let me think. Not obviously, unfortunately. Uh, and the reason is because um, this enumeration step uh, that, I, that I use uh, needs exponential space. So if you have only polynomial space, then n to the n is still the... Yeah, n to the n, no matter what you do, is still the best that we know. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.